This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Good morning and welcome to Loose on the Lead. I'm Seth Merrill and as you can see, I am solo in the studio this morning. There is no Steve Bick. Mr. Bick, living the dream as he is headed to Florida for uh, the next week or so. He'll be down in the Gulfstream Park area doing his radio show down there and uh, enjoying some of the racing as well, I'm sure. So I'm solo in here this morning, at least as far as the first segment, but I'll be joined by phone a little later on. Gary West from ESPN.com. Going to uh, catch up with Gary. Haven't talked to him in a few weeks now, so he's a guy who is keyed in to uh, the three-year-old scene and uh, we'll get some of his thoughts on how things are, are shaking out so far on the Derby Trail. We'll also take a look out at the San Vicente this afternoon for three-year-olds out in uh, Southern California, and maybe more importantly, that very, very good Southwest tomorrow at Oaklawn Park. A little later on, John White, speaking of Santa Anita. We'll also get an update from him on uh, his thoughts. Uh, over the last week or so racing, Game on Dude last week out at Santa Anita, also uh, uh, Candy Boy uh, winning uh, the uh, three-year-old event out there last week. Uh, some thoughts on Bayern, who was the nice winner for Baffert just this past week on Thursday. Uh, so we'll get some thoughts again. Three-year-old trail and broader picture from John White and uh, Gary West as well. Uh, with the nice racing last weekend, I want to get some of Gary's thoughts on that. Don't forget uh, racing this afternoon. Aqueduct is canceled, so keep that in mind, but plenty of good racing around the country this afternoon. And as noted, uh, tomorrow at Oakland with the Southwest, that gives you a hint. It's a holiday tomorrow, President's Day, and so there's some racing at many venues around the country and some pretty good racing as well. But first things first, this afternoon, Gulfstream, uh, their Rainbow Six. It's getting to the point where the Rainbow Six is now attracting a lot of attention. It's a 20 cent bet. It is one of those jackpot bets that only gets paid off if there is a single ticket holder, a single winning ticket holder. Otherwise, there is a consolation. If multiple people have all six winners, there is a consolation. But it's getting to that point now where the consolation is pretty good. And so this pool is now starting to uh, attract some attention and add some good money every day. It is now up to $862,000, the Rainbow Six at uh, Gulfstream Park. Over at Fairgrounds there, I think it's called the Black Gold Five. Similar type of thing. It's a jackpot bet, but it's only a pick five. Their pool is up to 313, 318. Um, and over at Oaklawn Park today, they have a carryover in their pick six, which they call the Classics. Um, Oaklawn Parks. And that, theirs is a base $1 pick, I, I, I believe. Um, but their pick six this afternoon at Oaklawn, 37 thousand dollar carryover and uh, before I go on as a Syracuse graduate I just have to say for any other Syracuse graduates or fans out there it is it, luckily I have now put the uh, the paddles next to the TV so uh, over the past couple of games I get the jolt and somebody leans down and says they won the game and I'm back to life but uh, the game last night against North Carolina State second game in a row where they brought it right down to the wire so it's been fun if you've been a Syracuse fan uh, you know, you can't watch the horses all the time, and Syracuse is uh, providing a, uh, <laughs> a stretch run and taking it right to the wire for the photo finish in the last couple that is kind of analogous to some of the closer horse races you see out there, but it was a fun game last night. do want to remind you of some of the events here at Capital OTB, teletheater, branches, and online. Uh, Coming up uh, next Saturday will be another show Viber contest online next Saturday down here at the Clubhouse Racebook. It is the prize wheel, prize wheel day. Uh, patrons selected at random to spin the big prize wheel. That's next Saturday down here at the Clubhouse Racebook. The next couple of Mondays down here, and that includes the holiday tomorrow, knockout challenge, $100 knockout challenge based on the aqueduct racing. So again, that's the next couple of Mondays right here at the Clubhouse Racebook. Also coming up on Friday right here at the Clubhouse Racebook, Friday the 21st, the return of Brian Nadeau and the $500 happy hour bankroll. Uh, that's at the Clubhouse Racebook again, 711 Central Avenue in Albany. On Sunday, 
February 23rd. That's a week from today online. It will be the Sunday Syndicate, and you can sign up uh, uh, through the 20th. Uh, that's a little bit later this week, but you can start signing up now via CapitalOTV.com to participate in the Sunday Syndicate. And one more reminder, if you are a, a player in the handicapping series we have down here at uh, Capital OTV, the March edition of the handicapping series is the Shamrock Showdown, and it's March 1st. So keep that uh, in mind. Mark that on your calendar. That will come up as soon as the calendar page turns. March 1st, here at the Clubhouse Racebook, the Shamrock Showdown. You can find more all about these promotions and events at CapitalOTV.com. Again, Aqueduct is canceled for today, but it's been a rough week. Boy, it's been a rough winter, but over the past few days, the storm that hit uh, the coast and up uh, the northeast has uh, taken its toll. Laurel had canceled Thursday, Friday, and yesterday, and that's unfortunate because yesterday uh, they had the Campbell and the Fritchie scheduled. Those are rescheduled for next Saturday. However, they also have a couple of nice uh, stakes races, including the General George scheduled for tomorrow at Laurel. So you would assume everyone will be dug out and ready to go by tomorrow. But uh, yesterday's cancellations included Aqueduct, Laurel, Turfway, Charlestown, and Penn National. That was yesterday. As far as today, Aqueduct uh, has canceled. And again, with holiday racing, including over at uh, Aqueduct, uh, and the Aqueduct tomorrow includes the Holly Hughes as far as the stake schedule. You would assume everybody will, will have, be back on and, and uh, up and running. We'll keep our fingers crossed, though, because there is plenty of good racing scheduled on the holiday. A uh, couple of news items that if you watch Racing Across America during the week, I, I may be hitting on news we, we've already touched on, but uh, of course on the weekend show, I'm sure the audience broadens a little bit, so I just want to mention one of the notables over the past week was Larry Colmas has been named now to succeed Mark Johnson as the Churchill Downs announcer. And Larry Colmas for the past, what is it, three or four years, not going back more than four, I would say, he has been on a, just a crazy trajectory. Uh, winds up uh, being named to replace Tom Durkin on the NBC racing broadcast, some of the higher profile races uh, in the nation, if not the world, obviously, with things like the Breeders' Cup and the uh, Kentucky Derby. Uh, subsequently, also uh, down at uh, Gulfstream Park in the winter, he had been doing Monmouth in the summertime. And some of the articles I read about this transition to him now to the Churchill booth actually looked back at that race a few years ago at Monmouth that became that went viral as being a, a little bit of a launching point to uh, put Larry Colmas in the public eye and it was that race if you remember and if you never saw it go look it up on YouTube it is kind of funny but there were a couple of horses in the Monmouth race called my wife knows everything and the wife doesn't know who had an incredible stretch battle and Larry Colmas made the most of it there at Monmouth. Again, that was, we're going back three years, maybe four uh, at this point. But it, the viral went video and put Colmas in a little bit of a spotlight. And it's just, as I say, he seems to be really on a tra trajectory now, including moving into the announcer's booth down at Churchill Downs, a number of the articles that covered this. I mentioned Mark Johnson. and. and portrayed him as maybe being a little bit controversial uh, with the presentation. Um, the Churchill people said they were going for a little bit of a different kind of a pre uh, presentation in that uh, Mark Johnson was part of the uh, between race chatter, the, the handicapping of races and whatnot. I, I liked it. I, I liked Mark Johnson as a race caller. I had no, I, although I, I will say I'm not critical of many race callers. A lot of folks point to various race callers around the country and like this one, don't like this one. I, I'm pretty neutral on, on most of them. The, sometimes they're really great calls and some of the callers maybe stand out a little more for me, but there aren't too many I'm, I'm particularly down on. But I thought Mark Johnson was uh, certainly acceptable. I liked his calls at Churchill Downs, but uh, Churchill in the press release have noted they want to go back to a more traditional role for the caller and they say it's an amicable separation between Churchill and uh, Mark Johnson, but Larry Colmas now uh, moving into the announcer's booth at Churchill Downs, which, and as some of the articles have noted, typically when this happens, and it's going to in this case, when a, a high-profile announcer moves from one high-profile job to another, 
Colm is going to Churchill means he's now going to move out of Monmouth. And as these articles have noted, that then uh, sets in kind of a domino effect. So somebody will now have to fill in uh, out at, at Monmouth. And one of the names I've heard, Rich Eng, the Las Vegas uh, Review Journal, mentions uh, Vic Stauffer, who is now at the closure of Hollywood Park. Vic Stauffer's kind of floating around down there. And I have uh, Vic's uh, announcer I like too. So. Uh, Meadowlands uh, under Jeff Girl, which has really been innovative, not only on the harness side, but I think just uh, uh, racing structure in general with the, the uh, new facility they have down at the Meadowlands. I think that is forward thinking. It's going to be fun to watch and see how well that does, but they uh, shrunk their facility. They added some nice amenities for the fans. I think that was a great idea, but Girl with the the way he's uh, approaching racing down there at Meadowlands, interesting as well. So uh, hats off to the Meadowlands people, and they continue to be a little bit forward thinking. Racing, uh, uh, Daily Racing Forum article notes that uh, Meadowlands is going to experiment with some added distances on the sulky side. Uh, every night, starting at, sometime this week, I think, but every night the 10th race on the card will be contested at a mile and a 16th and have a field of 12. So I just think, it, it, again, I think this is forward thinking. I don't know whether it's going to work out. I've always said one of the things I like about harness racing, it's a great place to start your handicapping because there aren't as many variables on the, uh, as on the thoroughbred side. One of those is they're always mile races. And when I was a kid just getting into the game, it seemed like a lot more tracks played around and experimented with either shorter distances or longer distances. And it just never seemed to catch on. So I'm not quite sure whether this will, but I think it's, A, it's very interesting, the, the distance uh, variety. But putting in fields of 12 in uh, harness races, I, it's going to be fun to see and see what, what kind of handle they, they pull in on these races down at the Meadowlands. But as always, I just kind of tip my cap uh, to them for, for at least giving it a little bit of a, a shot. Uh, that has to be applauded in, uh, in the realm of horse racing, whether, again, on the sulky side or the flat side. Ron the Greek, this is kind of interesting, won the uh, uh, Jockey Club Gold Cup at Belmont Park last season, subsequently was sold to Saudi Arabian Connections and is now racing in Saudi Arabia. He's not, no longer Ron the Greek, he is now Watani, and Ron the Greek slash Watani won his first start for the new connections over in Saudi Arabia yesterday, did it pretty easily. So Ron the Greek now with the Saudi Arabian Connections raced in Saudi Arabia, won, looks like one more race in Saudi Arabia, and then we'll head on to the Dubai World Cup. So Ron the Greek, now a world traveler under new ownership, and over there in the Middle East making some noise and probably aimed towards a Dubai World Cup night, as is. Yesterday at Gulfstream Park, Twilight Eclipse uh, won uh, the uh, Mac Diarmida, and subsequently got an invitation to the Dubai Shima Classic uh, Dubai World Cup night on March 29th. Uh, Tom Albatroni training for our friends at West Point Thoroughbreds said we're all talking about we were all talking about going to Dubai depending on the outcome of the race. So they were talking about it beforehand with uh, Twilight Eclipse winning. Uh, uh, Albatroni says so now I think that's the way we'll go. So we'll have a little bit of rooting interest for our friends at uh, West Point Thoroughbreds on Dubai Cup, World Cup night as uh, Twilight Eclipse likely now for the Dubai Shima Classic off of that uh, win yesterday in the McNear meetup at uh, Gulfstream Park. On the other hand, over the past few days, Mucho Macho Man, his connections have announced they will skip the uh, World Cup, but that means things are shaping up nicely for the big cap out in Southern California. Mucho Macho Man uh, will skip Dubai World Cup, aim for the Santa Anita Handicap, uh, will take charge, also has been announced to be going to the Santa Anita Handicap. So this is shaping up, as I say, to be a very nice event uh, set for March 8th out at Santa Anita. Mucho Macho Man turned in a nice workout uh, at uh, Gulfstream over the past, uh, what, day or so, going 58.16. Uh, they were pretty happy, trainer Kathy Ritvo, with the workout. And just they were looking at the timing and whatnot. Uh, they, I think they were really looking at the Dubai World Cup, um, but as, as they came out of the workout and looking and just kind of deciding what was best for the horse uh, at this point, and again, knowing he has an affinity for Santa Anita, probably played a big role in this, but mucho macho man. No Dubai World Cup, Santa Anita big cap instead. 
do want to alert you uh, a little ho story horse perhaps on today's card, Sunday card at fairgrounds. Keep your eyes on the fourth race today. There's a Steve Asmussen uh, trainee going out for Stone Street Connections. You may remember those connections as being the owners and trainer of Rachel Alexandra. Well, her full sister goes out today in the career debut. Samantha Nicole, fourth race today at fairgrounds. Samantha Nicole, maiden race for three-year-old fillies at a mile and 70. And uh, that is a full sibling to Rachel Alexandra. Rosie Noprovnik will be on board. Again, race number four at fairgrounds. The full sibling to Rachel Alexandra. Samantha Nicole going out today. All right, that's going to take us to our first break. When we come back, it's going to be Gary West of ESPN.com. A little later on, John White from Santa Anita. We're going to talk some of the races over the past uh, week or a couple of weeks or so. We're also going to look forward to some of the action today and on the holiday tomorrow. All of that as Loose on the Lead continues. Stay tuned. This is Steve Beck. Join me Tuesday through Saturday here on OTB TV for At the Races, my Sirius XM daily news magazine of the thoroughbred industry. Handicapping, interviews, analysis, everything you could want. 6 a.m. OTB TV. Hysterical lady, Ginger Punch, Ginger Punch to win it. And it's Wilco in front, and he's going to pull off a huge upset here. But it's Round Pond going on to take the distaff. Awesome again. Star of 10 Great One winners, four Breeders' Cup champions, and four multi-millionaires standing at Adina Springs. It's more than just a sports bar. It's Stadium Cafe. Located at 389 Broadway in Saratoga, it's the place to be for great times and great food. Their menu features everything from gourmet entrees to your favorite wraps and sandwiches. Or maybe you just want to grab a beer and catch the game. So what can be better than that? How about two Stadium Cafes? There's also the West Side Stadium right up the road at 112 Congress Street. Same great menu, same great service. Whether you're hanging at the bar or just relaxing outside on their spacious covered patio, you'll always leave knowing you'll be back again. We love, above all, the staff. We love Dave Harmon, and the food is fantastic. Not one, but two. 112 Congress Street, 389 Broadway. Guaranteed to be a home run. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTV.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTV.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Loose on the Lead. Happy to be joined now by Gary West of ESPN.com. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, Steph. How are you? Very good. And Gary, as I noted before the break, we'll talk a little three-year-olds with you. I haven't talked in a few weeks, so I want to catch up and see where you think we are on the Derby Trail. But also, I wanted to get uh, 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 some opinions on last week was certainly a, a very nice weekend of racing all across the board. And I want, do want to touch on also, right down in your backyard, last night there was a nice comeback effort, and I did want to note that. Uh, Sam Houston, little $75,000 stake, the comeback of... Fifty Shades of Gold, who was so promising earlier in her career, first couple of starts, Lone Star, then won the debutante, won for fun over at Churchill, and then had that very troubled trip in the Adirondack, came out of that injured, but Fifty Shades of Gold made a uh, winning comeback last night at Sam Houston. Yes, that was very uh, gratifying and encouraging to see her come back like that. She's a beautiful filly, a strong, long striding filly, very professional, and as you know, she won her first two races by 18 lengths last year before they had a run back where she almost got put over the inside rail and, and came out of that race with a bone chip in her knee and, and also a cracked hand and bone, so that required surgery, and she has come back now. They, they picked this relatively easy spot at Sam Houston last night simply because most of the stakes right now, most of the good races for three-year-old fillies are starting to be around two turns, and she's not quite ready for two turns yet, so they, they selected a, a relatively easy spot for her, and she won in, in pretty flashy style by uh, more than two lengths, uh, a good time for the evening, and uh, I think she's back um, 
getting back on the road to becoming a, a very good filly. So I'm, I'm eager to see what happens to her in her next start and eager to see what happens when they stretch her out. I know her trainer, Brett Calhoun, is optimistic that she can stretch out without too much trouble, and she has such a good mind. I think she'll be able to get at least a mile on the 16th, maybe even a little farther in Kentucky. Yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed because, as I say, that was just a, an unfortunate incident in the race at Saratoga, so it's good to see her back on track. Rosie Napravnik over from the fairgrounds for the ride last night, and I will note, I was talking before the break, Gary, Rosie Napravnik back at the fairgrounds this morning, and I think there will be a lot of attention uh, on that fourth race this afternoon at fairgrounds with the full sister to Rachel Alexandra, Samantha Nicole, uh, set to make the career debut. Yes, that's exciting, isn't it? Uh, she seems to be uh, training very well down there. And, um, goodness, there will be high, high expectations <laughs> for her. I, I don't know what she can possibly do to satisfy everyone who will be watching. But it's an exciting uh, debut down in New Orleans today. Yeah, no question about it. And uh, speaking of the girls' side of the game and, and talking about uh, some nice races we had last weekend, all, weekend long, all week long on uh, television, I've been asking the guests about some of those uh, races and some of the action from last week. And, Gary, while we talk here, just going to pick up the entire race of the Hurricane Birdie. We'll watch that as we talk. Um, and... and the career finale for Groupie Doll. I just want to get your thoughts because I said it all week long. This is like a Hollywood script because Groupie Doll, the number one horse, as we watch the video here, will just be totally out of it. Breaks poorly as we see the break here. And down the backstretch, I think everybody is sitting there saying, oh, what an unfortunate way to end the career. But then they turn into the stretch. And as I say, it was like a Hollywood script. What were your thoughts about Groupie Doll? Well, uh, my, my thoughts were exactly the same. And, and I've seen her throughout her career, but um, she was doing nothing early. And, and I, I thought, you know, this is unfortunate. She's going to go out like this. But uh, we saw the the real Groupie Doll um, when they turned down the lane, and you know she had a uh, a bravura and a charisma that that horse racing will will very much miss. Uh, she was sensational. I would say probably the best sprinting uh, mare we've seen since Safely Kept, and uh, one of the outstanding ones for sure. And my only regret about her career is that we didn't see her run against the boys more often. Yeah. That isn't necessary. You know, my Juliet and uh, Tawi are great horses, were great horses, recognized as such, in part because they beat males with regularity. They both won the Vosburg, I believe. I wish we had a chance to see her against the males more often. I think she would have won the Breeders' Cup sprint against the boys. Well, certainly we're just watching her come under the line now, and certainly you look at that performance uh, last weekend, and boy, if they picked the proper spot, she certainly, you know, off of a race like that, you'd have to think she would have done very well yeah. uh, against the boys in the particular spots. But again, that was nice. I also want to get your thoughts because a couple of weeks ago, on the uh, ESPN site where you uh, contribute regularly. You had a nice article about the handicap division and how that there was some excitement there. And I noticed at this point, and again, this was before last weekend, Lee wasn't on your list, but I would imagine if you were making a top ten of older horses now, Lee would be right there. Well, he certainly would be. You know, he was on the radar, but um, he certainly wasn't, uh, in my thoughts, in, among the, the leaders of the division. Until until the dawn, when he, he just gave a spectacular, dominating performance um, against uh, the, the last year's champion three-year-old. So um, I don't know really at this point what to think of Lee because you know early in his career he was primarily a turf horse, and um, now he's moved to the dirt and he's moved to the Bill Mott barn and he's doing obviously spectacularly well in Florida. Will he be able to transfer that to other racetracks and? Uh, um, continue and uh, to do that and show that consistency. I thought we'll take charge in a big race to be second, actually a pretty close second, uh, given all things uh, considered. It was way back to third, but but Lee certainly would be among the leaders of the division at this moment. Yeah, and I said all week long just what you said just now. I want to see Lee do it away from Gulfstream yeah. Park because some horses freak on that track. And I thought given the circumstances and the way that Gulfstream Park track plays, I thought that was a really nice effort from Will Take Charge. Well, yeah, he was in traffic, and obviously the, the track down there is a little kinder to speed than, than, than most. And uh, I thought Will Take Charge just ran a huge race. And, and finally, uh, your thoughts on Game on Dude out in Southern California last week. Well, I'm a little worried about him uh, simply because, you know, this three in a row he's lost. I can't remember him ever losing three in a row. Um, and uh, he didn't show much fight coming down the lane. He rather capitulated. Um, without much argument, and um, 
you know, we've seen him get beat before when he wasn't able to uh, um, show his early speed when they tried to rein him in, and uh, that wasn't the case here. He just went too fast early and just had nothing left. You know, he was, at, at the eighth pole, he was a charred match. He was done. And um, I, I, I think game on dude perhaps is slow to step or two now, but uh, that's okay. He, he's had a couple of sensational years. Yeah, and... Uh looks like next up they still will be aiming for the big cap which is shaping up to be a nice race now we'll take charge they announced mucho macho man and if game on dude gets another shot out there that should be a, a really fun race early in the uh, year for the handicap division all right gary let's shift our attention now to the three-year-olds and before we get to some uh specific races to take a look at look at and your thoughts uh, back the past week or so and forward for this holiday weekend as well. I just want to generally get a couple of thoughts. Shared belief and honor code, and I want to relate that to a story you had up on ESPN.com over the past week. Kind of interesting looking at the dates the recent Derby winners have made their three-year-old debuts, and you noted that if, if a straw doesn't get in the path, both shared belief and honor code still could be real players in the picture because it doesn't take an early start in the three-year-old season. At this point, I still think shared belief is up against the eight ball because we haven't seen much anything as far as real workouts. Honor code, however, looks like they're now pointing for a specific race, the Rebel out in Oakland. So again, given the, the stats you came up with, it looks like at least honor code is maybe still on the trail. I, I agree. Um, four of the last 10 Derby winners made their seasonal debuts in March. You know, that was unheard of until until the last decade. Uh, typically, a uh, horse on the Triple Crown Trail would begin his um, seasonal run-up in January or February. And uh, if you look at the previous 10 years, I think the latest start was uh, late February. Um, so uh, things have changed, and um, horses are, as we all know, um, making fewer and fewer starts. And I think uh, trainers are trying to go into the Derby with a horse that not as you know, the emphasis used to be on having a battle-tested horse, a very seasoned horse. And now I think uh, more trainers are inclined to prefer to have the uh, fresh uh, horse going into the derby, relatively fresh, and uh, one that uh, still has a lot of gas in the tank. And it's a, it's a tough balance to go there with a horse that uh, is fresh and a horse that isn't ready. And, uh, and that's a tough thing to maintain. But um, that said, I think Honor Code is still on track to make the derby um, by all means. You know, he... Uh, worked only three eights the other day with the official time, but I understand he galloped out a strong five eight. So uh, he should be able to make the uh, Rebel in mid March and uh, then come back with one more race, possibly the Arkansas Derby or the Bluegrass um, before the uh, Kentucky Derby. And, and, and you note the 21st century uh, training now is a lot different, you know, and it's a fine line between fresh and not ready. And that just adds another huge puzzle to the handicapping uh, of the Kentucky Derby for those oh, it of sure us. Does. Yeah. yeah, it really does. Yeah. All right, let's uh, take a look uh, as we talk three-year-olds now. Go back to last weekend, the Bob Lewis. Uh, that was uh, an anticipated race because folks wanted to see what Midnight Hawk would do. Midnight Hawk is the uh, six-to-five favorite, winds up running third. Uh, the winner in here will be Candy Boy, the number one horse. The other baffer, Chitu, the number seven horse, will wind up second. And again, Midnight Hawk to three as we watch the stretch run here, here will wind up third. Uh, last week, uh, you're a participant in the Courier uh, Journal Derby poll. I noted last week's poll you had Candy Boy at number six, so I assume you were impressed with this performance. Very much so. Um, granted, he had a perfect trip. Um, basically, but still he did it the right way, and he's a big, long, striding horse who looks to me like uh, a mile and a quarter won't be a problem for him down the road. He finished up strongly in this race, galloped out strongly. I, I like him quite a bit. Um, Chi too, I thought, hung on gamely down the lane, but uh, he just doesn't look like a, a, a classic horse to me. I think a mile, mile and a sixteenth will really be his best distance. Um, Midnight Hawk, um, you have to be disappointed with him, but uh, he's still in the ball game. All right, and now I want to turn the attention. We've got a couple of nice races coming up for uh, the holiday weekend, San Vicente this afternoon. But first, I want to look at uh, right down there in your neighborhood over at Oaklawn Park, the Southwest Grade 3 event. Talked about a little bit earlier, Gary, uh, on the handicapping show. 
This is maybe the, the deepest, toughest field of three-year-olds we've seen so far this year. Tapature coming out of the win last fall in the Kentucky Jockey Club. Coastline, who I think was a little bit disappointing for Mark Cassie, but I think he's expecting better uh, tomorrow. Tanzanite Cat, who won the Smarty Jones. Louis Flower, I'm looking forward to. That springboard mile has been so productive over the past couple of seasons. I'm also looking forward to Paganall, who was impressive in the career debut. Uh, Bourbonized in the first couple of starts has shown some promise. And Gary, while we talk, we're going to go back and look at the stretch run of the hopeful and see strong mandate run. I've been interested as I've talked to the various people here on television over the past couple of weeks. A lot of people are really looking forward to the uh, return of strong mandate and think he's going to be a real player in this division uh, this year. What are your thoughts on tomorrow's Southwest? Well, I, I would I would certainly um, be in that group as well. Um, you're watching the hopeful now where he, he draws off to win by, what was it, almost 10 links um, over a, a very good field, and he was taken in hand late. Uh, that was um, obviously strong mandate at his best. He came back in the champagne, and, and uh, the jock really took him out of his race when he took him back, and, and that didn't work out. But uh, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile was an interesting race where he ran third because of the, the splits there. He had the, what, the 13 hole, and... Uh, they went 45 and one nine and change in the front end, and he was the uh, the leader in, uh, into the lane. Um, I, I really think he ran of that group the best. He gave the best performance in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile because of that very hot pace. Um, so I'm, I'm very um, excited to see his return. He's training, from all reports, superbly um, at at Oakland Park. I've talked to Wayne about him. Wayne Lucas is trainer, obviously, and uh, he, of course, he's. You know, he's a man of faith, and he has tremendous faith in his horses, um, and uh, he has a lot of faith in this horse. He says Strong Mandate is doing very well, progressing mentally and physically. So, yes, I'm excited to see Strong Mandate um, in the in the Southwest, but what a great race it's, oh, it's yeah. uh, shaping up to be, an 11-horse field and several proven horses in there in addition to Strong Mandate, and some very intriguing ones also. Um you know, Louis Flower obviously won the Springboard Mile. I, I think he's a horse who could be uh, somewhat surprising. Um, Kendall's Boy uh, from the Tom Amos Stable. Uh, he uh, tuned up for this race with a sprint victory in New Orleans. But, you know, if you look at this horse, he's only run one bad race in his life, and that was in the Breeders' Futurity on uh, Keeneland's Poly Track. Other than that, he's been outstanding, and he uh, finished second to Havana in his debut. And uh, his other two races on the dirt are both victories. And his pedigree says he should be able to stretch out with no problem. So I'm excited to see Kendall's boy. I think he's a sleeper in here. You mentioned Paganall. I, I like him quite a bit. He could get a perfect stalking trip here. Uh, he beat a good horse named Street Strategy in his debut. Ride on Curlin is another one who uh, I think could be dangerous in here. The pace, I believe, is going to be very lively. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what they choose to do with strong mandate. He's fast enough to go to the lead with this bunch. Uh, I suspect, though, that they'll try to restrain that natural speed and uh, maybe even stalk and maybe let uh, one of the others, Louis Lauer, maybe uh, have the lead. But uh, the pace could be lively here, and right on curling can come running. Uh, Bourbon Eyes, you mentioned. Firestarter, I think, is an interesting horse as well. He, he had a troubled trip in the Smarty Jones. He galloped out strongly with the winner, and um, I, I think he's probably better than we've seen from him so far. So a, a wide open, after the uh, obvious choice, strong mandate, a wide open race, and a very, very intriguing bunch of horses. Yeah, I think it's an absolutely fun race, and as I said, it could be the strongest field of three-year-olds we've seen so far this season. Now let's go out to the San Vicente, which is a little bit on the other end of the scale, uh, with Indianapolis not making the race. I think it's a field, and I've said it uh, a couple of times, more than a couple of times over the past month or so. There are a number of these three-year-old races along the early along the Derby Trail, which I think are more barometer events uh, where uh, the folks are just trying to sort out and see what they have. And I think today's San Vicente looks kind of like that kind of a race. As we uh, talk here, I'm going back to uh, January 18th and the maiden breaker for Roger Rocket. Uh, out of this field, I think this is a horse that maybe has a little bit of potential that we don't kind of know the ceiling yet. We've only had one race, and it is a Bob Baffert horse. So this looks like the one that may be sitting on a little bit of a breakthrough performance that uh, could improve on the number in the first start. But again, to me, it looks like perhaps just a little bit of a, a barometer kind of race. 
Well, I agree entirely, Roger. Rock, rocket uh, rallies from uh, what was the fifth or sixth, and uh, uh, won that race going five and a half. And uh, he's a son of pulpit, so you have to think that uh, he certainly is going to get better with distance. And uh, today's race is seven eighths of a mile, so. Yeah, he has a big upside. That was a pretty slow race, by the way, for Santa Anita. But still, uh, you think that uh, this horse wasn't uh, wasn't playing the game where he's uh, suited to show his best, but he could be uh, today. Uh, Cherubim, I think, is uh, the speedster in here who's going to be tough to catch and probably the horse to beat. Kobe's back uh, might be an, an interesting horse as well. He showed a lot of talent at two and then had a uh, bad, bad race in the cash call futurity, but he seems to be training superbly. An interesting point, I think, be made looking at these two races about the grading of stakes races um and uh, these two races i think uh, make an excellent argument for grading races after they're run not now uh, this is ludicrous really the southwest is a great three and it's an 11 horse field with um, se- uh, several stakes winners in it and uh some horses that I, I suspect are going to go on and be stakes winners that aren't already. And then you have the San Vicente, which is a great two. And let me see, uh, I don't even think there's a stakes winner in the field. There's even a maiden in the field. Um, uh, you know, oh, that's right, Kobe's back, uh, won a little stakes in his debut. Uh, but that's a great two race, and the Southwest is a great three. Obviously, that is absurd. Uh, that, really? I mean, that, that, that's yeah. ridiculous. And uh, the, the graded stakes committee to grade races after their run, identify races that are going to be graded or reviewed to be graded so that uh, 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 trainers can, can shoot for those. But you can't grade, grade them until they've been run. And I think these two races emphasize that quite clearly. Yeah, 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 make a great point. The grade two versus the grade three uh, over the next couple of days. There's definitely uh, something uh, amiss there. All right, Gary, before I let you go, I just want to touch on uh, a couple other winners from the past few days. Uh, Tamarando wins the El Camino Real Derby yesterday, and going back to Thursday, Baffert's Bayern, very, very impressive. Any thoughts on those two? Well, uh, Tamarando, of course, um, ran a big race, got up just in time to win. But uh, he's, a, he's a better horse on a synthetic surface than on dirt. And I think we saw that here. And, of course, he's a better horse in that kind of company. Um, he's a, a nice horse. I really like the horse. I wish I owned the horse. He's wonderful. <laughs> but I don't think he's a derby horse. Um, as for Bayern, uh, that might be a different story. He was, he was uh, sensational. He was flashy when he won by, what was it, 15 links on Thursday. Um, a solid clocking for the day. And the only I, I want to see him do it under different circumstances. Because he got away with a very a slow opening quarter, a very moderate opening half mile, 47 and change. What's he going to do when he has to sit behind somebody going 46 and change on the front end? Or is he going to go out there and go 46 and change, and then can he still finish the way he did Thursday? Those are questions that we have yet to answer, but this is a horse that's only run twice. So uh, there's a, a big upside with, uh, with the Bayern. And, uh, of course, he's in very capable hands with Bob Baffert, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Bob's going to set him on a path that uh, will enable him to show his talent. So he's an exciting horse. He's, he's now among, the, uh, you know, among the, the leaders on the way to Churchill Downs. Yeah, and it is shaping up to, to be a very uh, interesting and intriguing and fun derby trail this year, I think. Uh, certainly at the top end, shared belief and honor code. We're still waiting for them to, to get out there on the racetrack, but horses like Cairo Prince have validated what we saw last year and a couple of surprises along the way as well. Gary, you're a guy who follows the trail, and uh, we can follow your thoughts on ESPN.com, where, again, you contribute regularly, and certainly we'll check in with you uh, within the next few weeks to get another update. But thanks for the visit this morning. My pleasure, Seth. Thank you. Gary West from ESPN.com. We'll take our next break. When we come back, John White from Santa Anita. Stay tuned. I'm Seth Merrill. Join me weekdays at 10 for Racing Across America. We'll look at important races from around the country, get insight from top handicappers and analysts, and preview the upcoming week in racing. That's Racing Across America, weekdays at 10, right here on the OTB TV network. I didn't want to get just any degree after high school. Horse racing has always been my passion. I was already a lawyer. When I was young, my dad took me to the races. The sound of the crowd, I still remember. I'm 40, and I don't want to stay in a career I don't love. I want to follow my passion. Follow your passion at the University of Arizona Racetrack Industry Program. 
Wagering at CapitalOTBBet.com is as easy as one, two, three. One, Capital Bet TV, the fastest and easiest online wagering experience where you can monitor five different tracks simultaneously. Two, Capital Bet Express. Its straightforward program layout and interactive handicapping information lets you build your wager quickly and efficiently. And three, Capital Bet Pro, designed especially for the professional horse player. CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. Fascinated by the world of horse racing? Interested in honing your handicapping skills? Class is in session. Night school. Monday nights. Easy to access online. It's free, interactive, and informative for the casual and serious race fan. Horse player now buzz. Live horses to watch emailed to you daily. Our eyes, your prize. Night school in the buzz. Visit horseplayernow.com for details. I'm Jeff Carl. Join me Saturdays and Sundays at 9 for the Handicappers Report. We'll handicap the top tracks across the country and help you prepare for the weekend in racing. That's the Handicappers Report. Weekends at 9, only here on the OTB TV Network. Welcome back to Loose on the Lead. Happy to be joined now by John White of Santa Anita. He's the morning line odds maker, also paddock commentator. If you watch the uh, simulcast signal, you'll see him each and every day. You can also find his selections every day over at the Santa Anita website. Good morning, John. Good morning, Seth. How are you today? Very good. Happy to have you on board, and uh, we appreciate it as well, knowing it's an early start for you out there on the West Coast. But uh, we're in the middle of a holiday weekend. You've got a three-year-old event this afternoon we want to talk a little bit about. Also, we want to go back to last weekend, a big weekend out there uh, uh, seven days ago. But before we do that, uh, just want to tell people, John also has nice online articles that you can read each and every week, and I typically link on Equidalian. John just wanted to tip the cap, the most recent article. Nice uh, remembrance of the Sunday silence, easy go or rivalry. Well, some of those columns are more fun to write than others, and that one was fun uh, going back down memory lane. It's just very sobering that it's been a quarter of a century <laughs> since that rivalry yeah. took place. You believe it? But uh, it was kind of fun relieve, reliving it. Yeah, all right. Uh, let's go back to last week, and before we go to the Southern California races, I just wanted to touch on, because I'm so sure you saw uh, out at uh, Gulfstream Park, get your thoughts, and I've been asking everybody all week long, both that groupie doll crazy performance for her career finale, and then the nice performance by Lee, which also I thought was a good performance uh, uh, by Will Take Charge as well. Well, and uh, we're excited about the Will Take Absolutely. Charge situation because he's headed to the Santa Anita Handicap, as is uh, Mucho Macho Man, which was announced yesterday. And the Santa Anita Handicap in recent years has really been hurt by the $10 million Dubai World Cup. That has, that's such a strong magnet for uh, connections. And understandably, when you're talking about that kind of money versus the $750,000 Santa Anita Handicap, so it's really nice that this year the Santa Anita Handicap appears to be coming up so strong with Mucho Macho Man and Will Take Charge, which is a rematch of that dramatic finish in the Breeders' Cup Classic last year where they came down to a photo finish <laughs> of about an inch. And then you have Game on Dude thrown in the mix, and he'll try to get back into winning form. He's got a three-race losing streak now, but you never want to take a two-time and need a handicap winner and sell him two shorts either. So we're excited about that. It was great to see Groupie Doll go out in such spectacular fashion. Uh, I, I kept chuckling at the way a lot of uh, horse players were saying that she was not the same as the year before uh, when she was coming up to the Breeders' Cup last year, and her time was the same in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint as it was the year before. So I, I was kind of scratching my head, and People were saying that they didn't even like her Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare turf, uh, sprint victory of 2013 as much as 2012, but yet the time was the same. So, uh, And she, she proved with this victory uh, at Gulfstream in her career finale that she, she really was the same. So uh, I think she was a deserving two-time Breeders', uh, uh, Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare sprint winner and a two-time Eclipse Award champion. She was a true champion. It'll be interesting to see what she does as a broodmare. Yeah, it was funny how the internet works. <laughs> you know, going into last year, you know, the middle of last year, uh, the folks with Groupie Doll, oh, she's not the same, she's not the same. And then after Saturday, everybody said, why is she retiring? <laughs> exactly, yeah, they're, they're a real, real about face on that. So, 
a lot of times somebody just throws something out there, and then a lot of people just kind of swallow it hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> and, you know, you, sometimes you just got to kind of think it through and, and don't just accept everything that's being said as the gospel. So, and, uh, you know, going into the Breeders' Cup Philly Amer Sprint, and I got to make those morning lines for the Breeders' Cup, and I made her the favorite for that race, and she, she did go off as the favorite. But I made her a much softer favorite than the year before because she looked like an absolute slam dunk in 2012. But uh, there was the question going into the Breeders' Cup last fall whether she was the same. But I thought she answered the question by defeating a strong field in the Breeders' Cup. And then she really showed it, as I say, with this career finale. And that's a great point you make, Seth, in terms of one minute people are, are down on her because they say, ah, she's not the same. Why are they even bothering to race her? And then the next thing is she wins, and it's, why Why are they retiring her? Let's keep going. I tell people as they get into the game and handicap, don't get hung up on that what have you done for me lately scenario. And that's particularly pertinent along the Derby Trail. I think these three-year-olds who are lightly raced can easily throw in something that looks like a little bit of a clunker and come right back the next time and get back on form. So well, that, you know, a horse that could fit that bill is Midnight Hawk, because yeah. now here's Midnight Hawk, who was very impressive in his career debut, and then he won the sham, and there were people that were kind of down on him for winning the sham, but that was kind of a funny race, because there were only four in there, and it was really kind of a match race with Christo. And yes, Midnight Hawk was disappointing in the Robert B. Lewis because he, he was in the perfect position at the top of the stretch, and he didn't get the job done. So yes, it was something of a disappointment. But look, you know, a good example of this is the Admiral, who Bob Baffert, you know, this horse was uh, kind of a disappointment until yesterday at Santa Anita, and he put it all together yesterday. It ran a very good race. So people are, like you say, Seth, sometimes they're pretty quick to judge and and. A lot of times they, they are quick to get off a bandwagon or get on a bandwagon, particularly off one performance. Yeah, and another one of those three-year-olds that I'm looking at in the same vein is Goldhawk, who was third in that race a couple of weeks ago down at Fairgrounds. But I think that may be one that, that could be a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately kind of. Let's, let's give them one more. So it, it, along the derby trail, there's a lot of that. Well, let's shift our attention now and look at the older horses uh, last week. You, you alluded to this already, but I wanted to look at the stretch drive of the San Antonio and specifically get your thoughts. Blue Skies and Rainbows and uh, Game on Dude went out early, went head-to-head -head through some uh, fast early fractions as they turn for home. Number five, Game on Dude, is going to uh, fade to be a disappointing fifth in this race. But the winner, number uh, six, Blingo for John Sheriffs and uh, the uh, Zenyatta connections of uh, Jerry Moss and his wife, are going to duke it out down the lane with a really tenacious imperative. What were your thoughts of last week's San Antonio? And again, what, what are the thoughts going forward for Game on Dude? Well, Game on Dude we just, uh, is a question mark because is it because he's getting up there in age? Or, you know, I mean, again, we can excuse, it's easy to excuse one race, and uh, sometimes we can excuse two. But when you, like I say, now he's on a three race yeah. losing streak, and he's always run so well at Santa Anita. I mean, other than the Breeders' Cup Classic, he was undefeated. And he'd never lost a grade two race in his life until the San Antonio this year. He was four for four in grade two races. So that's not a good sign either. Uh, but, the, you know, this is a race that, uh, you, I mean, let's face it, uh, it uh, Game on Dude and Blue Skies and Rainbows, they just ran each other into the ground. It's as simple as that. And one thing that Jerry Hollendorfer, for his presence here in Southern California, has uh, made an impact on some of these races. Bob Mafford has won some of these races by running top quality horses and top quality horses who kind of get things their own way. Think of how many times Game on Dude has gotten his own way in a lot of these races in California. Well, with Hollendorfer, he is a very competitive guy, and he's not about to hand these races to Baffert on a silver platter. Uh, so what we saw was Blue Skies and Rainbows go on the attack right away. And Game On Dude, when, when he gets into a situation like that, he's uh, not always been able to come through with a victory, to say the least. So, uh, And it won't be any easier in the San Anita handicap for him again with Mucho Macho Man and uh, We'll Take Charge scheduled to ship in. Lingo's an interesting horse, the horse that won the race, because there's a lot of talent there, and once again we're seeing the tremendous 
horsemanship of John Sheriffs. I mean, look, he didn't just uh, only train Zenyatta. I mean, he's had great training jobs in the past. Manistique was a huge filly that uh, was something on the brittle side, and yet uh, won practically all of her races in her career for Sheriffs. And Sheriffs has got a real kind of head case here with this horse. He, he often will lose his race uh, on his way to the paddock. And uh, in, in New York, they allowed him, he got permission from the stewards to have a pony accompany this horse from the receiving barn over to the paddock, and he ran a very good race in his final start uh, in New York before he returned to California. And then he, he ran a disappointing race. He was kind of a wise guy horse in the San Pasquale, but he, he ran his race before the race because he, he just went goofy again on his way to the paddock. And uh, you'll appreciate this, Seth. You know, the, the closure of Hollywood Park played a role in this because uh, before the San Pasquale, you had Blingo stabled over at Hollywood Park, and he was unable to get him over to San Anita to school him in that paddock. Once Hollywood Park closed uh, and sheriffs got the horse over to San Anita, he schooled them repeatedly before the San Antonio. And you can see the difference it made. I mean, the difference in the performance by Blingo in the San Pasquale and the San Antonio was night and day. So he's a dangerous horse in the San Anita handicap. Yeah, and again, that's shaping up to be a really nice race with Mucho Macho Man, Will Take Charge, Game on Dude and whatnot. All right, John, now i got to get it. Uh, your thoughts shifting over to the three-year-old scene. i got to go back to uh, last Thursday, I believe it was, uh, with an allowance race out there. All eyes were on a couple of Baffert starters. Tappet Rich, who had shown so much uh, a promise very early on, and then it, kind of his own worst enemy, but they changed up some equipment a little bit, so Tappet Rich was going to be interesting, but uh, another Baffert runner in there, Bayern, making the second career start, and as we watch the stretch run here, it will be number one Bayern winning, number five Tappet Rich, well back in second, however, just give us your first-hand impressions, your bird's-eye view impressions of Bayern. Well, the one thing right away, he's named after, I guess, the soccer team in Germany, and I understand it's uh, Bayern. So, oh, okay, uh, all well, right. That's one thing we're learning. Uh, these names are such a challenge, Seth, uh, and I was addressing that in the simulcast commentary yesterday at San Anita. I mean, I go back and try to find out how to say these horse names, and I'll, I'll go to the replays, and I'll hear Trevor Denman calling a horse one thing and Vic Stopper <laughs> calling him another, and so which one do you go with? I mean, you know, it's... It can be really challenging. So uh, evidently this is because um, Kaleem Shaw, the owner, did say in the winner's circle after this victory Thursday that uh, he is named after the soccer team in Germany, and uh, I guess the pronunciation of that soccer team is Bayern. So uh, it was very impressive, no question about it. I, I mean, not only did he win impressively by 15 lengths, uh, with blinkers being taken off, but he galloped out super after the race. Uh, and he's got the pedigree t to be a Kentucky Derby horse. Uh, Awfully Wild is by Wild again, who won the inaugural Breeders' Cup Classic at a mile and a quarter. And Byron's Dam is by Thunder Gulch, who not only won the Kentucky Derby at a mile and a quarter, but of course the Belmont Stakes at a mile and a half. So there's lots of stamina in that pedigree, which is good. My main issue with Byron, and I, I kind of get a kick out of this, because in recent years we've had this happen with Curlin in 2007, Dunkirk in 2009, Bodie Meister in 2012, and Verrazano in 2013. Horses who were very impressive in victories early in the year as three-year-olds who did not race as two-year-olds. And the thing about the Kentucky Derby, I have my nine key factors uh, in which if you don't uh, qualify in any of those uh, nine categories, you get a strike, and it's my strikes system for the Derby, and uh, which you are so kind by running my expressbet.com column uh, at Equidaily. A lot of people have really uh, started to embrace this system, the strike system, and the thing about this, uh, not running as a two-year-old, I consider that my most important strike. If you get a strike in that category, you are really up against it for the Kentucky Derby. Because, I mean, <laughs> we have to go back to 1882 for the one and only horse that ever won the Kentucky Derby that didn't run as a two-year-old. That's Apollo. So what we're talking about, Seth, it's now been 131 straight Kentucky Derbies in which the winner did not 
the winner did race as a two-year-old, 131 straight. In other words, the score is 138 to 1 in terms of, a, of Kentucky Derby winners who raced as a two-year-old. Now, am I saying that, that Bayern or, you know, even somebody else might come along and win the Kentucky Derby who didn't run as a two-year-old? No. It could very well happen someday. And what I'm really, I'm kind of hoping it does, because the way people seem to uh, approach this is once somebody does something, they feel like, well, that settles it, and we don't ever have to worry about that again. So let's say hypothetically that Bayern does win the Derby. Well, that would mean then the score would be 138 to 2. <laughs> so what, are we going to ignore the 138 and just embrace the 2? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I like to have the odds in my favor, and the odds are against Bayern winning the Kentucky Derby because he did not run as a 2-year-old. Like I say, does that mean he can't win it? No, he's very talented, and of course he can win it, and he's got a trainer that certainly knows how to win the Kentucky Derby. But to me, this is one of the most important factors that uh, you need to take into consideration for the run for the roses. Did the horse run as a two-year-old? And in the case of Byron, he did not. Yeah, and it's one of those things that now with 21st century tw training, people keep waiting for that, that two-year-old seasoning not to be as, as important, but it still is. But, yep. uh, uh, John, we only got about a minute left, but I did want to get to this afternoon because you have a little three-year-old event out there at Santa Anita, and I wanted to get your thoughts on the San Vicente, grade two, 200,000. They're going seven furlongs. I said it earlier on the show, this to me looks like kind of a barometer race. The horse that was going to attract a lot of attention, Indianapolis, didn't make the race. And now this is, uh, there's some lightly raced horses. Kobe's back has, a, you know, a stakes win on the resume. The other ones, as I say, I think the trainers are just maybe trying to sort things out. We looked a little earlier at the replay of Roger Rocket, who I thought in the career debut was impressive coming from way out of it to win. But that one, I think, would have to step up. While we talk, I wanted to look at the maiden breaker from uh, Cherubim back on December 28th. Pretty impressive maiden breaker in the second career start with the move over to the dirt at Santa Anita. What were your thoughts on this afternoon, San Vicente? Well, I saw Kobe's back schooling between races yesterday, and I'll tell you what, he really made a very favorable impression with me. I mean, he was on the muscle, but not too much so. I mean, he looked like he's primed for a big effort. Uh, so I, I like him even better now than I, I did originally, and, and he was my pick in the race. Uh, I think, and uh, one thing about it, uh, John Sadler and the owner here, the uh, Searing family, they are extremely high on this colt. I mean, they 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 really think he's the real deal. And that, forget his cash call fatality; that was a complete disaster. He almost fell during the race, and after that, Joel Rosario just wrapped up on him. Uh, so I really like Kobe's back today. I think he's. Uh, Indian, it would have been interesting to see him run against Indianapolis because he could have had his work cut out for him for sure against Indianapolis. But without Indianapolis in there, uh, I think Colby's back is going to be very tough. Now, Trubum won and won a very good time, won a weight and change. And as you mentioned, I think the danger in the race is Roger Rocket because he didn't get that big of a buyer speed figure, but it's a five and a half furlong race. He really kicked it in late. He kind of reminded me of Painter when Painter was a debut winner at five and a half and just kind of scratching the surface in terms of the ability of painter. So Roger Rocket, I think, is the danger, but I'll be very surprised if Kobe's back doesn't win today. All right, sounds good. John, we got to wrap things up. We always appreciate the visit, and certainly we will be checking in in the coming weeks as Santa Anita Derby coming up, the big cap, and uh, so we want to get your opinions on those. And, again, you can find uh, opinions galore every week from John White uh, with his online columns. I link to those on Equidalian. You'll be adding the strikes within, uh, what, a couple of – well, the strikes can't, you can't determine a horse's strikes until they run their final prep before the Derby. So that once we get into the, to the season where horses are saying our next start is the Kentucky Derby, that's when we, we go into strike season. Sounds good, and we'll be looking forward to that. John, again, thanks for the visit. We'll talk to you down the road. Thanks, Seth. Have a great day. All right, John White from Santa Anita. A little earlier on, it was uh, Gary West from ESPN.com. Got some good three-year-old conversation uh, as it is. Uh, three-year-old time of year, but I think tomorrow's uh, Southwest is really shaping up to be a very definitive uh, three-year-old event. But again, this afternoon at Santa Anita, also the San Vicente out there. So uh, 
plenty of good action today. Don't forget, tomorrow is a holiday, so there's plenty of good racing action around the country on tomorrow's Monday card as well. We'll be back in tomorrow for Racing Across America a little earlier, the Handicapper Support. Did the Handicapper Support earlier today with Jeff Carl. So hopefully we handed out some winners. Cash some tickets, enjoy the racing this afternoon. Don't forget, if you have some questions, comments, or suggestions for us here at Loose on the Lead, you can email us at looseonthelead at yahoo.com. Also visit our Facebook page. We would love to hear from you. That wraps things up for Loose on the Lead for this week. I'm Seth Merrill. Again, my partner Steve Bick is uh, on his way to Florida for uh, a week down in the sunshine. We're all envious. The guy's living the dream, but uh, hopefully I filled in aptly as a uh, solo today. Here we're here every uh, Sunday from 10 until 11 a.m. That wraps things up for Loose on the Lead for this week. We'll see you next time. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.